Hi, this is Remembering the Past, the show where we talk about people who've died recently, who've had a profound effect on our history, our society, or our culture. Tonight we're not going to start out with a person, but with a television show, Sabado Gigante, or Giant Saturday. Sabado Gigante is a Spanish-language television program broadcast by Univision. It was Univision's longest-running television program and the longest-running television variety series in history. Sort of a combination of laughing, the gong show, and dancing for the stars in Spanish. It was created and hosted by Don Francisco, a.k.a. Mario Kreutzenberg, a nice Jewish boy born in Chile. It started out in August of 1962, and after 53 years, it just ran its last show. Here's a report from CNN on the final show of Sapado Gigante. <laughs> Sábado Gigante has been part of many generations and is very popular in Latin America and here with Latinos in the U.S. But like everything that has a beginning has an ending. And Univision Communications announced Friday that the show will end on September 19th of this year. The show includes all kinds of segments like games where people can win cash prizes and cars. They also have a singing contest, comedy segments and talent shows. They even have a segment where they do a paternity test between couples. Another interesting segment reunites family members that haven't seen each other for years or even decades. In 1962, Mario Kretzenberg, better known as Don Francisco, created and started hosting the show in Chile, but then moved the production to the city of Miami in the U.S., and the show was then broadcasted to some 40 countries around the world. This move made it possible for people like me and my family in Puerto Rico to view the show. For decades, the show has brought in strong ratings, and as recently as last Saturday, Sabado Gigante was the most watched network show among the targeted 18 to 34 year old demographic. 74 year old Mario Kretzmer said in a statement When we began in the United States in 1986, we told them that we were separated by distance and united by the same language. Sabado Gigante or Giant Saturday is a show that, that many generations, including mine, will really miss. Nelson Quinones, CNN. Atlanta. We're going to move on now to Milo Hamilton, who died recently at the age of 88. Milo Hamilton was a longtime baseball broadcaster for a whole bunch of teams. He broadcast for the Cardinals for a year in the 50s, where he broadcast with Harry Carey, which is important in his later story. And he did a whole bunch of other things. And he did a long time here in Chicago with the White Sox and with the Cubs. He's best known, however, for his time in Atlanta, where he broadcast in the early 70s. And in the Braves' home opener in 1974, he called Hank Aaron's 715th home run, the home run that broke Babe Ruth's lifetime record. It's sitting on 714. Here's the pitch by Downing. Swinging. There's a drive into left center field. That ball is going to be out of here. It's gone. It's 715. There's a new home run champion of all time, and it's Henry Aaron. The fireworks are going. Henry Aaron is coming around third. His teammates are at home plate. And listen to this crowd. This sellout crowd is cheering. Henry Aaron, the home run king of all time. 7-15. A lot of these longtime baseball announcers have a catchphrase when guys hit home runs. My old Hamilton's was Holy Toledo. And it's interesting he didn't use it there. I don't think he wanted to overshadow Hank Aaron. Well, that sellout crowd was an exception for the Braves. Their attendance lagged in the mid-70s, and Milo Hamilton criticized him on the air. That didn't go over well. So when Ted Turner took over the Braves, he replaced Milo Hamilton. One of the people who was his replacement was Skip Carey, Harry Carey's son. And the story takes a turn a couple years later when Milo Hamilton winds up back in Chicago broadcasting the Cubs, and he's supposed to take over for longtime icon Jack Brickhouse as Jack Brickhouse retires. But who falls into the Cubs' laps but Harry Carey? And Harry Carey and Milo Hamilton are on the air for a while, and it's safe to say that they didn't get along. Here's Milo Hamilton calling a home run while he was broadcasting with Harry Carey. Swing high! Way back in the deep center! Ballpark will never hold it! Going, going, going! Oh! The Toledo's going on a high pitch! The feud between Harry Carey and Milo Hamilton intensified. Milo Hamilton criticized him on the air. It became obvious that Harry Carey was the one who was going to take over for Jack Brickhouse. And the Tribune Company, who was running the Cubs, had to make a decision. And hey, Harry Carey was becoming an icon here in Chicago, so you know who was going. Anyway, Milo Hamilton wound up in Houston. He spent the last part of his career, and in fact the longest part of his career, with the Astros. They loved him down there. 
So I guess it turned out okay for him also. We're going to move on now to Jackie Collins, who died recently at the age of 77. Jackie Collins was a romance novelist. Now, in a lot of her old bits, they're calling her one of these feminist models and feminist icons. I mean, look, she wrote risque novels for women. I mean, they were entertaining risque novels for women. And she did sell millions of books, but they were risque novels. I mean, we're not talking about the apogeal literature here. It's not Emily Bronte. Anyway, she was born in London, tried her hand at acting. Then she moved from Britain to Hollywood with her older sister, Joan. Yes, that Joan Collins. And she took up writing. Here's the telegraph on Jackie Collins. British-born author Jackie Collins has died at the age of 77. The best-selling writer known for her steamy Hollywood stories was the younger sister of actress Joan Collins. On Twitter, the Dynasty star said, Farewell to my beautiful, brave baby sister. I will love you and miss you forever. Collins sold more than 500 million novels in more than 40 countries in a career spanning four decades. Her debut novel, The World is Full of Married Men, was reportedly deemed filthy and disgusting by author Barbara Cartland and was banned in Australia. Collins said the book was ahead of its time, although she was said to have been unimpressed by more recent takes on the genre, including Fifty Shades of Grey. Her books were known for their strong female characters, something she put down to a perceived imbalance between her parents. In a statement, her family said Jackie was a true inspiration, a trailblazer for women in fiction and a creative force. They said she will live on through her characters, but we already miss her beyond words. Here she briefly outlines the philosophy that was embodied in her books. I think women should have very interesting lives and do everything they want to do before they get married. Mm. And then when they're married... They're not sitting in their marriage going, oh, what have I missed? So in her novels, she let them know what they missed. We're going to close tonight with our feature, Jack Larson, who died recently at the age of 87. Jack Larson was a nice Swedish boy from East Los Angeles. He went to work in the movies in the 40s. He got some B-rolls, but then as television came in, he got an offer to do a new series. He didn't think it would last very long, and it turned out to be the role of a lifetime. Or at least it seemed like the role of a lifetime at the time. He played cub reporter Jimmy Olsen, who worked at the Daily Planet in Metropolis in television's first adaptation of Superman in the early 1950s, starring George Reeves. And for anybody who's never seen it, here is one of the most famous openings in television history. <laughs> Speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Yes, it's Superman. Strange visitor from another planet who came to Earth with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men. Superman, who can change the course of mighty rivers, bend steel in his bare hands. And who, disguised as Clark Kent, mild-mannered reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper, fights a never-ending battle for truth, justice, and the American way? Yeah, truth, justice, and the American way. How's that for your early 50s anti-communism? Well, Jack Larson playing Jimmy had primarily two roles in the series. One was his comic relief. And the other was to be someone who Superman rescued when he wasn't rescuing Lois Lane. Occasionally they'd give him an expanded role where he could do an imitation of Humphrey Bogart, but it was mostly G, golly, and where's Superman? With one exception. The show's best running joke was that Jimmy Olsen would always irritate the gruff, white-haired editor of the Daily Planet, Perry White, played by John Hamilton. Jimmy was always getting on Perry's nerves, and one of the ways he would do it was to call him Chief. So the most famous stock line that came out of Superman in the 1950s was John Hamilton as Perry White yelling at Jack Larson as Jimmy Olsen saying, Don't call me chief. And here's a compendium of those. And they used every variation at one time or another, with Jimmy Olsen yelling at Perry White or George Reeves yelling at Jimmy Olsen. You get the idea. Here it is. How many times must I tell you not to barge into my office without knocking? I know, Chief, but this is important. Don't call me chief. You... Chief, I'll go with Miss Lane. I won't let anything happen to her. And don't call me Chief! Lose him along the way! I'll be with you in a minute, Mr. Kent. Thanks, Chief. Don't call me Chief! I just thought I'd mention it, Chief. Well, then why didn't you take more notice of him? And don't call me Chief! And is your name Kent? No, sir. My name's Jimmy Olsen, Chief. Don't call me Chief! Chief? Don't call me Chief!
I guess you don't type as fast as you used to, huh, Chief? Maybe not as fast, but just as good. And don't call me Chief! Oh, there's a boy I want to see, Olsen. Yes, Chief? Don't call me Chief! Just a minute, Jimmy. I'll phone you when I get out there this evening, Chief. And don't call me Chief! Oh, I'm sorry, Chief. It's entirely my fault, sir. We peasants deserve to be knocked over. But don't call me Chief. I promise never to act like a millionaire again. You promise never to call me Chief again? Never to call you Chief. Never again. All right. Report for work in the morning. Oh, golly, thank you, Chief. What did you call me? I... And all I want to do is to get back to my office, where people barge in without knocking, interrupt me when I'm working, and bother me so I could scream. Golly, Chief, then you do like my work. Don't call me Chief. But that did feel if good. Did you want something, Chief? Yes, I'd like a couple of reporters around here who can write sensible stories. What's the matter with Kent today? Anyway? All right, never mind. Just tell Kent I want to see him when he gets back. And don't call me Chief, either. Have you got any ideas, Chief? You're supposed to be a reporter. You get the ideas, and don't call me Chief. It's sure good to see you again, Chief. Don't call me Chief. Gosh, Chief. Don't call me... Well, all right, James. This is one time you may call me Chief. <laughs> That last one was where they wrote a whole episode around Perry White being made the chief of an Indian tribe. Before I said it looked like the role of a lifetime, but it really wasn't. And the reason was that Jack Larson and George Reeves are probably two of the best examples of an actor being typecast. Superman ended in 1958 after a seven-year run, and George Reeves, who was so good as Superman, couldn't get other roles. And many people attribute his mysterious suicide in 1959 to that fact. Meanwhile, Jack Larson was typecast as Jimmy Olsen, and he couldn't get other roles either. He didn't like it that much anyway. The work hours were long and the pay wasn't that good, so he became a playwright and a libretticist. And actually, he was quite talented, but the problem was, for the rest of his life, he was always known as Jimmy Olsen. Here, late in life, he reflects on being typecast as Jimmy Olsen. Superman went on the air in 1953 in New York on ABC. At the time, and it became an instant success. Uh, I Love Lucy was already a huge success. Went on the air, I guess, in 52, very shortly. I'm not aware of the timings of these things, and I wasn't reading TV Guide or whatever at the time. But uh, we went on the air, and within a month, it was on the air. I realized that from being a young actor that was doing live television reading thing, I had become, you know, People Magazine called a TV teen idol, and I had become Jimmy Olsen. And everything that I had been able to do before, and I'd been in movies but nobody cared like that. I wasn't a movie star. But now I couldn't take the subway. If I went on the subway, it was a nightmare on the subway. I was asked to leave the little restaurant. I had taken a little basement apartment off of Madison Avenue. And I was having breakfast there one morning, a very late breakfast. And neighborhood kids, they had their lunch break and they saw Jimmy Olsen in this place. And suddenly the streets were crowded and the police had to come in and get me out from these kids who saw Superman's pal, and they took me around the corner to the Metropolitan Museum. So my life turned upside down, and this was not my idea of a good experience. I got panicked by it, and I refused to do any publicity. I now see, since I later in life have produced films with people like John Travolta and Michael J. Fox and such, I realize how important it is for people to be gracious about doing publicity when you're working for them. I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't do a magazine interview. I wouldn't do anything because I thought everything I do as Jimmy Olsen, publicity in this, is just a further nail in my coffin as an actor, Jack Larson. I could have done everything. It didn't matter <laughs> because it never let up and I was tight and I became... Jimmy Olsen, which is why you're interviewing me today. Say what you will, but he was a great Jimmy Olsen. I'm going to close on that note. I want to thank my producer and IT genius, Sid Taps. As a tribute to Jack Larson, we're going to play a song about Superman. It was written by the great Jim Peterick of the Ides of March. It was the follow-up to Vehicle. As Larry Lujak used to say, it's just a rip-off of Vehicle. But it was a pretty neat song in its day. Ladies and gentlemen, from Berwyn, Illinois, the Ides of March. Fast all that are speeding for the Superman, get a super love on that, but just that I can. I'll be, I'll be your Superman. Grab a hold of my Superman, ticket you never, never land. Wait, Jesus, I'll be your Superman.